Welcome back, everyone, to LCS Academy. The matchup right now, Evil Geniuses versus Immortals. And Immortals, they came in swinging in that game number one. They did. They were able to put a stop to a lot of things that Evil Geniuses were trying to do right off the bat. And it does mean, unfortunately, we've said this a couple of times, but we are going to be saying goodbye to CLG's chances to move into the playoffs. They were six games behind at the beginning of the day, and they needed Immortals to lose everything in order for them to have a chance to make it to the postseason. But we get to see a lot of cool things that Immortals did, and this was after a lot of the early plays that Evil Geniuses tried to make that were put a stop to by Immortals, and it just gives them the power to start going for their own plays. Yeah, overall, Immortals were very confident with the way they approached a lot of these plays. You know, normally you were talking about it, we see that out of Contracts. Contracts is always looking for the engage. Immortals punished them for that. They showed that the moment they make a decision, they are completely committing to it in a teamfight scenario. Time and time again, they were just repeating these plays where they would have these massive engages off Anda going for the backline. Already seeing the fancy Zoom. camera work right there of Anda joining into this fight. This is one of the cool things that Zach consistently does throughout all these fights, right? Is he goes in, he has an opportunity to get a fight started, and if he doesn't like it, he's usually tanky enough to just leave, right? He has <laughs> all the tanky stats. He built the war mugs as a second item, so if he didn't like a fight, he was usually able to get out and be ready to do it again in just a couple of seconds. So we can see that a little bit here, right? Like, Anda just jumps over the wall. He doesn't need to continue hitting the Baron. He ends up knocking up three people in the middle of the fight, and it's one of the reasons why Zach, even though he hasn't been nearly as popular recently, still has a lot of play in his kit. Man, that last play made me so sad, because you can see how much Team Luke was able to pop off, how he got really good position here, got so many autos in. In a different world, that could have been EG's game, but because Immortals were so far ahead and so dominant in the early game and in the mid game, this is the result you end up getting, just Immortals running right through the base of Evil Geniuses. It's kind of brutal at this point, right? But that's what happens when you go for a lot of these flips early on in the game. And I think Immortals are very happy with this, right? Because we already were looking at how they were a little bit on the come up. They were three wins, eight ties, and three losses prior to coming in today. Uh, they are guaranteed to not add a loss to that column. And they will improve to, where is that? It's 15-16 currently. And they're looking to even up their score, go a perfect 500 in the first eight weeks at 16-16. And we talked about it. Immortals really do need this because the next two games are going to be Cloud9 and Team Liquid. Every victory counts for both of these squads. But on the opposite end, this really hurts for Evil Geniuses when they were just able to move up to that fourth place spot. Now it's time for adjustments. Are they going to be able to adjust to some of the unorthodox picks that Immortals have pulled out, like that Zack we saw earlier? I expect that that's going to be taken off the table rather quickly here. It is... You know, not something that you tend to see very often, and those tend to be champions that get a lot of bans when people aren't used to playing around something that's a bit more unorthodox. You want to take it off the table so you can go back to playing the more traditional style that you've typically been seeing. You just go back, it's like, yeah, can you go back to playing like that Xin Zhao or a Lee Sin so that we can get like the traditional fight that we've been playing in scrims for the past couple of weeks? That would be great. I mean, first of all, you got, you got to have the Zin on the table and. With how often the, those champions are banned and how like choked we've been seeing the jungle pool show up, it's not that much of a surprise that we see pocket picks like that just suddenly show the light of day in matches where the stakes are this crucial. I think it makes a lot of sense, but I also know Anda has a lot of depth to his champion pool. He's been a pro for a long time. We've seen him play all kinds of different things throughout his professional career and during Academy. And so like the Zach is really cool and I hope we could see a little bit more innovation from that across the board from other teams but i know anda can play a number of other champions and i want to see if he's got anything else that's a little spicy to bring now over the side on evil geniuses it's a question to how they shape up their draft now because it wasn't it, it wasn't the worst draft to really see go through you do kind of see like their early game contingencies and how they want to set it up how they want to oppress some of these lanes to get towards that late game state where they're able to get jinx online uh, the problem I saw was just contracts went too diehard on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these engagements in the early game, and got punished way too often for it. Yeah, I mean we're being pretty harsh on contracts, and to some mm. degree deservedly, but they are risks that they are knowingly taking. 
right? They understand that these plays aren't the easiest things to go for, but they feel like they have the confidence to do it individually. And I, I feel like part of it and why we're focused so much on the jungle through this is because of the draft that they went with on Evil Geniuses. They pick Lulu as their second pick, R2, and this does mean that Jojo Pion doesn't have a lot of agency in these games. He's playing Lulu like he can get a little bit of priority, but he's mostly just a bonus stat spot. He gives you a shield, he gives you attack speed, he gives you movement speed, he gives you HP. And that's it. He doesn't really do anything on his own outside of the lane. That being said, though, you, you still have other people on Evil Geniuses who can carry. I mean, JoJo has played the Lulu before to success against 100 Thieves, but that was also a game where Tony Top was able to get his jacks. So... Yeah, the draft definitely needs to shape up better to be able to have those situations where you can have someone else carry and JoJo can lose that agency, just fall back into that support role. But you need to have basically your star player get a pretty good champion on top of that. I I think we really want to see a little bit of change in how this you know mid jungle two v two is going to be working for Evil Geniuses because contracts did. A couple of very ballsy things but it does mean that he's oh. the only one who can yeah a couple yeah, yeah. <laughs> more than one or two but he's also the only one on his team that can necessarily do a lot of these crazy things the only other person who has those tools is mystiques and unfortunately because he spent so much time out of lane on um, plays that weren't working it meant that he was simply behind the curveball in terms of what joey was able to throw yeah um both joey and mystiques were very active on the map and trying to make those plays come together uh, I, I don't even fault Mystiques as much for that one on um, being the slower. I, I, I felt it was more just Anda's impact on the map because he could pull the trigger before Mystiques could even get there. And that's what set up a lot of Joey being able to just walk in, start flaying people, get the death sentences left, right, and center as if it's that easy. Uh, that being said, I still like the play that came out of Mystiques, and I still like the play that came out of the bot lane of Evil Geniuses as a whole. I just want to see the top side of the map get shaped up a little bit better. And, you know, they are the kings of 1 1, Joshi. This. Could be another one of those. It could be, yeah. <laughs> what was it? We said, I said it just a couple of minutes ago. It was like 3, 8, and 3. That is a lot. No, that is Immortals. Evil Geniuses was 3, 9, and 2. Nine ties. That just yeah. means that they're trading series back and forth, right? That is way higher than almost any other team in the league, apart from Immortals, right? It's just such a close series. Like, they are very much like towards the middle of the pack, but they're also flipping. The thing is, the reason why they have more wins than they have losses is because they do tend to weight the coin. It's not quite a 50-50. It is closer to like a 60-40 in terms of how some of these early plays go. And I'm expecting to, as we said, I'm expecting to see that then go in the favor of Evil Geniuses this time as long as they don't come up tails a second game. Mm -hmm. well, with Immortals... I, I, I want to see more, man. I want to see more of what they were able to do in that game one, because that was really enjoyable to see go through. We've hyped up, you know, the no org members of Viper and Anda, and how much experience they have in the scene all together. Well, that lived up to the hype right there. Viper performed so well in that lane, as well as Anda really keeping uh, a good track of that lane and making repeated visits up there to stifen Tony Top. Uh, overall, like, it's really hard to stop this top lane from Immortals, and I feel like if Evil Geniuses are going to make a strategy, it has to start revolving around making sure they don't get the champions that's going to them them, allow them that success. Well, we'll get to see that. We're going to be hopping into draft here in just a second. The Viego coming through had some cool plays, uh, especially towards the end. Like, I was almost getting ready to get hype for Tony Top, resetting in a couple of those fights, unfortunately just a bit too far behind and continue to chain kills into kills, but we are going to be seeing the team staying on the same side of the map, and I wonder, are we going to get the same salty run back like we saw yesterday? We're always just waiting for the salty run back, Joshi. We just... We, we want these back. teams to be like, yeah, yeah that was nothing, let's actually... Let's, let's go again. We'll win it's this Execution time. different. It's, it's easy. <laughs> we, we can fix that. The draft was totally fine. So far, I mean, LeBlanc was the first thing that mortals banned away. Zhao, I... I think that was, this was definitely one of their bands. It, it was their first. It one. was their first. Yeah, it was their first. Yeah. Okay, so far the same. So far the same. All right. We don't have to talk anything about it, right? We're done? We can just go home until we see a new thing? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're completely done here. I know more okay. of it. We just got to finish up. But yeah, so far the, the bands do make sense. JoJo, you know, if you give him a champion where he can get on the map and start getting those 1v1, start roaming out for those rotations as well. LeBlanc would enable that for JoJo. Ziggs is something we've been seeing Team Luke play quite a bit of over on Ooh. Evil Geniuses. Okay. 
Thresh is a different ban, and that is a very flexible pick that, as I said in the last draft, can really just slot into any composition. A little bit surprising to me that they are the ones banning it this early, considering the fact that Immortals were going for Gwen as their first pick, and Thresh can be picked up after that. We've seen it play to great success as one of the first picks coming out on red side, even after the Gwen comes through. The Thresh of Philia is very strong, and even the Thresh would... Things like Jinx, also still a very powerful champion every single time they go head-to-head. -head. So, Evil Geniuses now have to see what they want to be giving over to Immortals as their first pick. Uh, traditional logic would say Gwen, but instead they're going to be banning Irelia. This does leave Jax up. So, Jax is a very prominent counter pick that Tony Top is really, really good at. So I'm going to be keeping a close eye on that, but other champions that did get left up from the last draft was the Callista. Another very uh, strong early game champion. You can do a lot with that rend. Uh, what I else always managed to the rift. No, I, I always yeah. managed to think about like thinking back to uh, I can't remember who it was, but I think it was Diamond who was saying like, "Oh, they left up the Callista. They didn't really <laughs> yeah. suffer, right?" <laughs> and so yeah. we'll see if that's something Evil Geniuses wants to go for. It doesn't seem to me like something that Team Luke uh, plays quite as much uh, based on his match history, but it is something that can be very aggressive and technically flexible between different lanes. We've seen it have a couple of games in the mid lane and the top lane over this past split, but instead we're going to be getting the Diana, going to be going over to Contracts and hovering the Tony Top Jax. I'm expecting it to get locked in, honestly. Yes! Yes! Tony Top on the Jax is an absolute beast. This is his champion right here. He looks so good whenever he's able to get on it, so I'm very excited for this. On top of that, my favorite champion, Diana, got picked, so I'm already hyped up for Evil Genius's draft. <laughs> Very different look coming in from them, and I like it a lot more brawling power. Now, how are they going to be adapting to the rest of it? The Nautilus is kind of one of the top tier supports now that the Thresh has already taken off, and the Callista going to be locked first, this time for Keith, right? You left it up, maybe you deserve to suffer. So, <laughs> Team Luke and Mystique going to be having a lot of difficulties. We're seeing a lot of Shadow Islands champs currently hovered for Immortals. This Gragas would surprise me if it was picked this early. But it does have a lot of play because it can just knock uh, all of these bruisers just out of the fight really easily. Instead of hovering over for the Orn, this is something that has gotten picked every now Ooh. and then, but Riffin gets locked in for Immortals going, oh, oh, wow, I was not expecting that. We're finally getting those, like, pocket picks coming out. We're finally getting those big ones. It's do or die time. This is when you bring out the big guns. Okay, and we also got the Gwen, it means it's no longer going into the top lane, so big decision coming out from uh, Immortals coach Jensen Go here to be giving Viper this uh, classic pick. I also have a little bit of a fun tidbit. Did you know that there's three of them now for Viper? There's Viper, General Sniper, and then they have a third one. I think he just like, he's 14, he just hit challengers like a Yasuo mid main. But, like, there's something about this family, man, that just, like, is really good at League of Legends. Definitely have taken notice. Now, over on the side of Evil Geniuses Academy, locking in the Alistair, so now you got a frontliner, you also got a diver. You can do a lot on the map and uh, help enable a lot of the wombo that we're kind of seeing from Evil Geniuses Academy. Because once you start getting into that skirmish, you know, the Counter-Strike as well as the Moonfall work wonders as a, as a follow-up to the Headbutt Pulverize combo. Just having a lot of things that you can follow up with is really important. I always like to talk about the difference between primary engage and secondary engage. And Alistar, absolutely fantastic primary engage. He just goes in, he's like, hey, we're fighting now. And whether you like it or not, it's happening. And Tony Top and Contracts on the Diana and the Jax have some great secondary engage tools. You know, you just counter-strike after the fight has already started. You jump in, you can stun a bunch of people in the middle of the fight. And of course, Diana, you catch multiple people with the hip up polarized combo. We've seen how powerful this combination can be when played by Cloud9, especially when you throw a Yasuo on top of it. So more bands coming out. Tristana's going to be taken away. It's something that's very comfortable for Team Luke. Team Luke likes having a lot of utility on a lot of the uh, ADCZ plays. And I say ADCZ, I use that word lightly when uh, Ziggs is in that pool. Well, well, it's banned. Rock is banned away. Not going to see that in phase number two, but Evil Geniuses, they are hovering the Varus for now. Do you like the Varus as a counter pick to the Callista simply because it has the slow? The Ezreal is also something you can leave alone more easily, so it will allow Mystiques to run around the map. But it's also fairly easy to dive, even in Ezreal. You have a Callista, you just throw your support at them like a Pokemon, and then 
You're just going to have that extra gap closer, so we're seeing a lot of aggression coming out right now from the bottom side of Keith and Joey. This Leona gets locked in. It's going to be a very dangerous time for Team Luke if he ever gets caught. Oh, most definitely it does get locked in as well. Leona, a very prominent engager, but this this is terrifying for the bot lane as well because, you know, with Leona, every time you land a skill, you get that passive applied on where if a teammate does damage, you get bonus damage on top of that. With a Kalista who already does a lot of damage, that is a very deadly kill lane in the bot side. And because you go Hail of Blades as well, it's also rather easy to get every single proc individually proc. You can get one off of the Zenith Blade, you can get one off of the Q, and then you get one off of the W. So every single auto attack is likely to apply the damage, and you're not going to be wasting any stacks of Daylight coming through from the Leona. But we see the Akali come through, they hover at the Zac, and this says to me that the Gwen going to be going into the jungle, and so we have three powerful women up on the top side of the map, and today, in fact, we have five powerful women coming out for the Immortals Academy roster, as it's going to be a very aggressive set of characters that they pick for themselves that are going to be very brawly throughout this entire game. Yeah, aggressive. That is the best word you could use to really describe that comp from Immortals. They want to go in. The moment Joey pulls the trigger with that solar flare, you should expect everyone to start diving in, going deep for the back line on uh, Evil Geniuses. Evil Geniuses, on the other hand, though, what do you think yeah. about their composition? Because we have aggression coming out from their side as well. <laughs> I like the composition in isolation, right? I think these are five mm. champions that work together rather well. And I do like the fact that Lee Sin is matched up into the Akali because it's, you know, you just press E in the middle of the smoke screen and you're going to be able to hit them pretty much every single time. The thing that worries me is they have less mobility than Immortals and do kind of similar amounts of damage. So I feel like Immortals is going to be more easily able to dance around these fights. It means that Evil Geniuses have to be more proactive with some of their wombo combos and trying to catch multiple people at the same time. Do you have Jojo on Lee Sin now? And Jojo being on Lee Sin, it's a very aggressive champion. It's it's kind of the champions we're hoping for Jojo to play to see that uh that um glimpse of the prodigy that we once saw before he was able to get into Academy. He looked really good there. Maybe we see some good performance coming out of here. Aggressive comps coming both ways. Team Luke still staying on the passive end, but this should be a bloodbath of a game. I want to point out right now that Keith is going to be using the Exhaust as his Summoner spell of choice, not going for the heal. We don't need any of that, you know, wimpy, you know, Summoner spells. We're going for Exhaust. We're here to fight. And he's going to be having the extra ability to reduce the damage of Team Luke whenever they go for dive. So Team Luke, I mean, with the tier, has to be very careful. Is going to get spawned down, take a decent chunk of damage, but not really going to have any real chance of closing that out for a kill. Not too many slows on the side of Evil Geniuses, so you're gonna have you're not gonna have too much of a of a counter for Keith on this Callista. It is very short range, and you do have a lot of short range champions in Evil Geniuses that they would do want to dive towards it. But there's still a wall of fighters you have to get through. Yeah, to be able to get towards I mean, Keith. You have plenty of the best crowd control, Eric, which is uh, death. Right, you can just kill them. Right, <laughs> if they step out of line. You know, the slows are helpful because they reduce the DPS in the moment, but all else equal, I would definitely rather have the Callista be dead on the other team than just slow it and auto attack me fewer times, you know? So Evil Geniuses is going to have to make a couple decisions here. They walked over towards the blue buff, but they don't actually stick around, so Team Luke and Mystique have to be very careful. Uh, just waiting for this to go through. Joey's not willing to uh, go for the riskier play. Doesn't want to pop the shield of daybreak in the face. Instead, uh, they're just going to be able to zone him out a little bit, try and deny some of these minions. But that's one of the good things about playing the Ezreal. You have that Mystic Shot, you have that range to be able to farm from a distance and not have to put yourself too often in threat range of Joey. Hard to not put yourself in threat range of Joey there, Eric. I mean, he does have the Shield of Daybreak <laughs> coming up rather soon. Good job defending the ward here. You know, just go in very aggressively so Joey can't auto Q auto any of those wards as they are placed down. So Evil Geniuses will have a little bit of safety because they know where Joey is. But level 2 already comes through. And we haven't yet paid attention to what the junglers are doing. So we did see that Contract started on his own wolves and then walked towards the top half because his blue buff was warded. But this also means that he's going to be in a really awkward spot where the timing of trying to clear out the bottom side of the map is going to be a little bit wonky because he has to walk towards the top side and then walk back towards the bottom. 
And then most likely you have to go to the, the top side again because you still have Keith and Joey holding priority of that bot lane. It'd be pretty dangerous to try and contest that scuttle. Really true. We're already seeing Enda come through. Five seconds until the scuttle actually spawns. Contracts is hitting his own blue buff. But as you said, I don't think he's going to be in a position to really try and contest the scuttle crab. Enda comes in, is going to hit this, and he's going to be like, oh, Contracts. This is an odd path that you've chosen to take for yourself. You should have already done this if you were doing a more traditional route, but the wolves into everything else does mean the contract's now running towards the top half, but hey, their lover, Joey Lee's Leona, going to be looking to potentially head them off. Kind of surprises me that contracts didn't want to end on the top side. Now you still have priority coming out from JoJo. Tony Top's been looking good on that top lane. Kind of a little bit of inefficient pathing coming out of contracts. He still will get the scuttle. There will be no double scuttle troubles. But now Contracts, he's setting Viper into his sights. Waiting for Tony right, Top to take that engage. Here comes the Counter-Strike. But nice. the stun Stop. comes ahead of time! Tony Top can't get the Counter-Strike to go off, so Viper will be able to survive. What a great stun coming out from Viper. Hits wow. both members and stutters Tony Top, so he can't get his own stun down. As you said, that keeps him alive and also means that he gets to save his flash. So beautiful play. Coming out from Viper, one of those small things that you only get when you're really a master of your champion. And I love this play that we're already seeing from Immortal stuffing contracts early game. And and the big thing there is it also burns Tony Top's flash. Tony Top flash forward, trying to get the last millisecond of that counter strike to get the stun. Just does not happen. Viper too quick, too furious, too fast this boy can be. Oh boy, he's like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, and now he's got Vin <laughs> Diesel coming up as well. I don't know any other Fast and Furious characters, but they're going oh, up man. top for a dive. Yeah, you know, Immortals know the importance of family as they bring the whole squad over up towards this top lane dive. Gonna make it look pretty easy. Joey will be taking that tower, but First Blood is now done. Going into the hands of Anda as Exhaust goes out onto Contracts to make sure he can follow up with nothing. Good play going over in the top side for Immortals. Wait. And it has exhaust. I didn't even notice that previously. There's a, a lot of aggressive summoner spells already coming out for Immortals. We said they were looking to fight, and like you said, with family, you can just bring more members to bear very easily. Jojo Pyun tried to be very aggressive and does push pretty out of the lane for a little bit as he teleports back. He might have also taken away a couple of the Raptors from Enda. So we are seeing a non uh, negligible lead coming out in the mid lane for Jojo Pion, and I'm really excited to see that we are seeing a more aggressive version of this guy than compared to what we saw in Game 1. Oh yeah, really aggressive. He just resonating strikes right underneath the tower. Not a worry to be had. He'll continue fighting in the mid lane versus Pretty. Taking a look at the junglers once again. Now they're both pathing towards this bottom side. Scuttle's going to be popping up. You still have uh, a lot of control coming over for the bot lane, but taking a look Ooh. at uh, what we saw with this tower dive earlier on Tony Top. It just comes through. You're going to be able to get it down rather easily as soon as you get all of the crowd control. It's just a simple matter of re-engaging. The exhaust coming through, like we said, from the jungler, just means that they are going to be able to walk out of that one. And with the priority that they built in the bottom lane, they're now going to be transitioning and his time towards his dragons. He also picks up the scuttle crab and it doesn't look like anybody from Evil Geniuses is going to do anything. His contracts are on the wrong side of the map. Yeah, Tony Top kind of started to come down, spotting out the area, but we'll just put down a control ward to get some vision. Mortals will secure this first strike without much trouble whatsoever, but contracts is now going deep into the enemy jungle, realizing that Immortals were just doing the dragon. This gives them room to go right after this blue buff. Well, I said wrong side of the map, and as soon as I said it, I was like, mm, maybe not the best way to put it, right? Opposite <laughs> side of the map, for sure, because now they're looking to make a play on the top side. Oh, now they just barely miss. Spiper. Elevation. This is, he, he's too slippery, too hard to catch him. Slither and Snake going all over the top lane. Tony cannot seem to lock him down to set up for JoJo, so Viper will continue his reign of terror. And I really do mean it. He's getting quite the CS lead already this early in the game. I'm still just like a little bit shocked right now that the Z axis still exists in League of Legends. Those small elevation differences between the river and not river uh, changes your targeting. And I think that's actually a big part of why JoJo misses that is because it is really difficult to adjust on the fly uh, when somebody walks over one of those ramps. And it looked like it would have hit if he was still in the river, but because that's not where his hitbox actually is, able to get out. Good flash coming out of Viper. 
Gets him away from the Counter-Strike at the same time that Contracts was headed up here. Look over the wall, though. You do have Anda nearby. Anda starting up Shelly. Viper still has control over towards this side, so it's not going to be too dangerous of a call right here. You still have Jojo who's resetting, so you're going to get priority from Pretty over in the mid lane. The rotation coming out of Joey. This should be pretty well secured for Immortals. Should be. And looking at where everybody else is on the map, it's going to be rather difficult because Team Luke and Mystiques are still in the bottom lane. We haven't yet seen this cow really unleashed. He's still in bottom lane with Team Luke, and it makes sense. You still got to get a little bit more time to get Team Luke up to a position where he should be feeling safe in this lane. But Joey in the mid lane. Yeah, looking to find yeah. onto JoJo, but not going to happen. Not going to happen. Can't get the kill just yet. JoJo is uh, hes a tough boy. You can take a few on the chin, Joshi. Don't doubt him just yet. <laughs> I'm not worried about him. I was just like, hmm, are we going to get a fight? I mean, it's hard to lock down JoJo. He had just used his W. But here, Mystique kind of announcing his position. Just got spotted see. out by that control ward. Haven't seen a ping come out. We are uh, signaling over towards the mid lane, and there's the Dragon's Rage onto Pretty. Pretty able to slide back in, but Contracts decides to challenge Pretty. Pretty's able to get away, oh. or the ultimate does go off, and now Joey's diving way too deep. It will get caught out. Contracts grabs that kill, evening this up. 1-1 one, one apiece. No flash means that Joey ends up dying. JoJo being very aggressive. I was very surprised at the initial Dragon's Rage, but Contracts now is going to be starting to build a small lead in the jungle, he was already ahead in CS, and now he's also equalized in kills thanks to a big play coming out from Mystiques. But the bottom lane and the top lane are looking pretty rough right now for the Evil Genius' side. Tony Top not able to get much. And Team Luke starting to fall behind in an honestly expected fashion, but one that still could be a problem nonetheless. Oh, Counter-Strike over towards the top lane. Gotta take a look at what happened in the mid lane, though. That Dragon's Rage was beautiful. Jojo gets out oh so easily, and look at Mystique's timing that headbutt pulverize to make sure Joey just gets locked down underneath that tower. I was a little concerned when he headbutted into them in initially, and then I realized, oh wait, there's nothing left that Immortals <laughs> have to actually like go for Jojo. They don't have any dashes, the pretty ultimated out, so it just means that they're going to be getting a free kill at this spot, but... I mean, again, this top lane, we get to see Viper Riven. He's already made one small play in terms of the stun that he got in order to get himself out. But this is a champion that can be really impactful in team fights if you find the proper flanks. And it's something that Viper has always been known for is his ability to just do very surprising things and get some really big engages because of it. Ooh, pretty having a hard time in the mid lane. Wants to return fire. Oh, Joe Joe will let the Sonic wave. He makes it look so easy, Joshi. Just so Ooh. easy. The timing, I was so worried that he was going to go down, but we got another fight in the top lane. Viper. Oh, oh, Viper tried to survive, almost makes some distance, but too much damage coming out of Tony Top, and Contracts is able to get that kill with the gank on the top side. All right, Evil Geniuses. Hey, now they're coming up heads in all of these fights. They're going to be getting a play up in the top lane as well. I was really worried that Jojo Pion and Pretty were going to, you know, dash at each other at the same time, and it was going to come down to whose damage actually procced first, but... Jojo, just a little bit faster, like, hey, if I do this and get the auto, it should kill you. So, and uh, coming up top lane, is he going to find anybody, and will he be able to fight it? Mm, not quite in time. Oh, he's nearby. Will he spot out contracts? Contracts used to go for the engage, but Tony Top is going to take the teleport back into this fight. Might be a questionable one, though. Anda is pretty low. Will be able to back off. Tony Top cannot find much else. Yeah, not actually going to get the Counter-Strike stun. Joey coming up to the top lane with it. Rift Herald is getting dropped. We might get a counter dive. Pretty's on his way as well. Here Our we family. Jelly's charge coming up. We get a good chunk onto this tower. Get it pretty low, but Joey's not willing to pull the trigger, and neither is the rest of Immortals, as they are just going to walk away from this lane. All right. Well, it's an interesting situation now because even though Evil Geniuses are currently up three kills to one, they're only up about 300 gold. That's only one of those kills as they try and find Viper, but the stun. Coming through from Riven makes it so hard for Jax to engage. And Jojo, looking down bottom to potentially interact with Keith, is going to be backing away. This is a little worrisome, because this is a lot of time for Contracts to be spending over there to get not get much. Now Evil Geniuses focusing over towards this bot side will go straight after Keith, locking him up, shutting him down. Pretty will teleport and join the fight, going after Mystiques. Gets a good chunk of damage onto Mystiques. Joey wants to find Jojo. That the Sonic Wave will fight him as they go right underneath the tower. 
Alright, good kill onto the Callista. Remember what we said at the beginning? This is the version of Evil Geniuses that is going to be coming up heads every single time. And is here, but Tony Top should just be walking away. He does just that. But I'm not sure if he actually spotted his Gwen. Now going for the engage on the Tony Top, but Tony Top hops away, no problem. Gets his control ward taken down. One of the things that uh, surprised me with that last play is just how uh, Evil Geniuses had contracts over on the top side. No, normally it's Immortals who should be making the play on the opposite side of the map. Instead, Evil Geniuses make a play down there. True. It always comes through. I also want to point out that that control ward, uh, it cost Evil Geniuses 105 gold in order to keep Tony Top alive. It cost 75 gold for Tony Top to place it, but he gets the only value he gets out of it is jumping away, and then it immediately dies, gives 30 gold over. So they lose 75 and give 30 over that. So that's a third of a kill that Tony Top spent just to keep himself alive. And it is... Better than giving a kill, but it was an expensive escape coming through. So Evil Geniuses are still in a position where there's a lot of game left to play, despite the fact that they've gotten a couple of good plays off this game already. Now, Tony Top going to take a recall. The wave is going to start to crash into his tower. Over a 20 CS lead coming out of Viper thus far. He's doing really well in that top lane. But over at Drake, looking to start this up, is going to be contracts. There are some members... Of immortals to try and contest this. Jojo getting fancy oh. there in the mid lane as the team fight's gonna break out, able to get the stun onto contracts, all nice. focusing onto contracts. Mystiques will be able to claim one though, as evil geniuses go one for one in the fight thus far. And uh, very deep into the face of Mystiques. Team Luke throwing out those mystic shots, trying to chip away at the health bars, but this Drake belongs to the immortals. Honestly, I like the play coming up from Pretty in the mid lane at the same time. They knew there was a fight about to brew, and you don't really need to kill Jojo Pion in that situation. You just need to prevent him from walking down towards the rest of the fight. But Tony Top, left alone up in this top lane, is going to be taking down the entire turret, and it is going to be punishing Viper for moving down. He only gets an assist for his time down in the bottom half of the map, but they do get the dragon. So here... You know, remember, Akali and Lee Sin are fighting. Neither of them can really come, and so it, it allows Team Lake Luke to just burst out the first member really, really quickly. He only just has to walk away, and once Gwen is the only person left for Ezreal to interact with, it becomes very difficult for him to do anything, because they just can jump on top of you and just out-damage you pretty much every time if you don't have your EF down. Man, Keith took so much damage at the start of that fight. Beautiful shots to come out of Team Luke. Mystiques. Hopping over the wall with that Hex Flash, the rest of Immortals. Started position towards the upper quadrant of the map. Do have Viper, who has taken the lane swap, headed towards the bot lane. Now taking his recall for the reset. Should be able to purchase his first major item now that he's taken this recall. You can see the collection of longswords he was able to get mm -hmm. as he does complete the Gore Drinker. Collection of longswords. They are, you know, <laughs> my favorite thing to collect. Okay, I was still looking mid lane, Keith. <laughs> Goes right after Keith. Keith gets destroyed. CC it all over the place. Contracts will grab the kill. And the rest of Immortals looking to follow up, but they don't know. Tony Top is waiting in the wings. Counter-Strike comes out. Get the stun onto Joey, but Joey will flash away to be able to stay alive as Mystiques is left all by his lonesome in the middle of Immortals, who will take him down. A killing spree for Anda off the return from Immortals, but we're not done just yet. Counter-Strike comes out looking to get the stun on the Viper. Tony Top trying to play defense here for Contracts, who goes golden, has to back off. Anda jumps forward. Not another kill to come out, but it's going to be one for one exchange nonetheless. Immortals are going to be the one with control of the map after the fight, though, and you're already seeing a couple members walk towards the top half. Are they going to be picking up? Are they just going to be farming? They're going to be grabbing the Scuttle Crab to try and figure out if Evil Geniuses ever go for the Rift Herald, but they are going to be the first ones to the lanes. It means that they have control over where the lanes are going to be going, and it will give them a little bit more freedom after they come back onto the map. Even though they're down about a thousand gold, they still have a lot more map control than you would otherwise expect. You know one of the things that was always one of the most tilting when, um, I guess, growing up with League? Uh, is just Timo? No, no, the sound you hear every time Jax whacks away at a turret. Oh, just hearing that over and over, that? all the way since I season one, Joshi. What? You I love are, it. You it's just are like, thunk, sadist, thunk, man. Thunk, thunk. It's so silly, right? It's like... I do the same thing with uh, TPA Shen, one of those really old skins where they hit oh, you yeah. like the, the clappers. And I just do it because I, I just love <laughs> hearing that sound every single time I hit somebody. Because it's, it's so, Here it so comes. silly, Here comes. right? Dunk, Here comes. Dunk, 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 dunk. <laughs> it's, the, it's the sound of slowly winning the game.
So Tony Top <laughs> is going to be walking away at this Split point. Push He's Chad, got... man. Split push Chad. <laughs> Got to find Sunder. Is this enough? Whoa, I don't think he realizes people are here. Uh, yeah, the Calvary is here, all looking to collapse onto Tony Top. Joey gets the shield of Daybreak. The CC is there, a lot of chaining, but the Flash is going to keep Tony Top alive and delivering a kill over him with the Dragon's Rage. Will he be able to acquire it, though, because the health bars are getting too low for Evil Geniuses? One picked up so far for EG, but it's going to cost them Mystiques, who goes down, and the rest of EG have to go on to retreat and forfeit this tower to Immortals. And again, even though it's a one-for-one -one trade, Immortals are the ones who come out with map control afterwards. They're the ones who grab the turret at the end, and it's kind of hard, right? I said at the beginning, I feel like these compositions do fairly similar things, but Immortals, with their extra mobility, are better able to navigate some of these complex teamfights that are coming through. With the extra gold, they are still only about 800 gold behind. But it also means that they're in a prime position to try and contest this next dragon. That'll give them three dragons on their way to Ocean Soul. Soul Point coming up quite soon for Immortals if they can get that Drake that you were just talking about. But it's not the only neutral objective on the map. You also got to look at Rift Herald. Oh. Can be a trade. Evil Genius oh. want to go for it. The damage on to Mystiques. Hey, Jojo. You can really bring it. But here comes Jojo. It's Sonic Wave Resonating Strike. It's the Tempest as well as... Dragon's Rage, a lot of damage on a pretty, pretty able to sidestep the True Shot Barrage, but Jojo will be the one that goes down. The Spears landing on him, Seeks forces him to flash over the wall, now going for the next challenger as Keith is able to hop away, grab another one, it's going to be Tony Top falling, diving Ooh. deep, is going to be Contracts, he gets a lot of damage in, but no kills to follow, a one for one trade in that last little skirmish, but it's so much more lost in the grand scheme of things for Evil Geniuses as their entire top side falls. And again, look at the mobility coming through from Immortals. It's rewarding them with this Ocean Dragon, giving them their third. Again, so close to actually getting that Ocean Soul. And we're seeing Evil Geniuses. Some of their plays are working, but Immortals are stuffing enough of them that they are staying in this game in terms of gold. And now they're even ahead at this point for the first time since this game really started. And Evil Geniuses really struggling to kind of find their footing. Watch how this play ends up working out. Right, Jojo Pin's the only one on the team who has multiple dashes, whereas almost everybody on Immortals has a freeform dash or can just dash multiple times. Pretty able to get out of this fight. He's not part of this big wombo combo. Uh, Onda able to get out of the fight. Joey able to walk the other direction. So Tony Top with only one dash can't stick to these guys. He's not able to get it down, and even though Contracts goes in and gets some good damage, nobody else is able to participate. Such a heroic play, command of contracts, but here comes a fight in the bot lane. Viper versus Jojo. Jojo with the fake out, resonating strike. Viper tried to grab it. He will not get it. Contracts has his number. Just barely coming through as contracts does come out, but Viper, we saw how close that was. A little bit of a fake out coming in, but ends up using his flash and not getting a kill. So that will buy a little bit of time for evil geniuses to let this Jax continue to scale up. But the game still has a lot of time left to go. Pretty going to be uncontested to take down this structure. But Jojo Pion, same thing on the opposite side. We might see a trade of turrets. Trade of turrets going off. Top four bot as Immortals continue their pressure towards this top side. You got to watch out for Mystiques, though. He is on the flank. He can respond to this, and so can oh. Contracts. Pretty doesn't look like he's aware of it. Headbutt Pulverize comes out as Contracts is going to dive on in. Pretty trying to make some distance. Going to use as much of that Shroud as he can to try and stay alive. Toady Top will get closer. Going Golden is going to be pretty. Buying time for Anda. Buying time for Keith. Now here comes Reinforcements. Anda's in deep. He's able to take down Mystiques. Now the Counter-Strike goes off. Buying time for Tony Top to avoid a lot of damage. But now that it's off, Anda wants more. Tony Top will back off. Joey will go down, but there's a cue to come out of contracts to show up with a double kill. Now three members down for Immortals. It's got to be evil geniuses in the driver's seat. They're going to be the ones looking to try and start up this bear. And remember, Enda's dead for another 20-something seconds. And Viper, really the only one here. Viper, I've seen no him way. turn these, but it's still a tough fight for him to go for. They're all caught up in the pit. The AoE would be nuts. Oh, contracts! He knows exactly the play Immortals were going to go for. Viper can bring nothing else to this fight. The ace goes through evil geniuses. They're turning it around. 
Not even close coming through for Immortals. Evil Genius is just able to turn off the Baron and catch both of these members. Keith really struggling to have an impact on this Callista, and as the Baron ends up coming through for Evil Geniuses, we're right back to them having a lead. It took them a little while to get here, but they finally have the Baron, they finally have the tools necessary, and they should be able to start turning around some of these upcoming dragons while they still have the Baron buff to play with. Man, this has been a wild game thus far. Honestly, a wild series, the way everything's been going out. I got to take a look at that last play that happened over on the top side, and the hunt that just came ruthlessly from Evil Geniuses. It does, and you see how long Pretty's able to navigate this fight. If this wasn't a 2v3, he might have been able to get out because there would be more people to distract the members of Evil Geniuses, but they don't have enough damage. You see that Joey ends up going rather low and ends up getting popped by contract at the end. There's just not enough damage when they aren't coordinated, when they aren't all doing things at the same time. Because if Viper wasn't there, at best that was a 4 versus 4 coming up for Immortals, and then we've already seen this come through. Contracts just get some, even with the exhaust, Keith gets blown up almost instantly, and Hyper doesn't really have a lot of opportunities to do much after that either. Just gets blown up himself, Pixel Brush. Now here we go, an attempted siege coming out from Evil Geniuses. Not finding too much just yet, trying to get closer to this tower, but it's very difficult to get towards the engage that Immortals have. The threat is always there. You still have Toadie top, split pushing over on the bot end. Whacking away at that tower, making that sound that makes me so disgusted as Viper looks to contest. Getting closer and closer, seeing the two one-tricks go at it with their favorite champions has definitely been an exciting matchup when it comes to this top lane match, and they still continue meeting as they go from lane to lane with their split push, trying to match each other. Now Evil Genius is at the gates of Immortals. The Sonic Wave goes out, not going to follow it up, just looking for scouting, looking to see the reactions. From Immortals, Tony Top pushes in this wave. Baron empowered minions doing a lot of work right now. Trying to continue this siege, Viper will be able to clean it out. Too much threat for Tony Top, but the moment Team Luke is able to get close to that tower, he will wail away on it. Tony Top going to use the Counter Strike now, breaking the base is going to be Evil Geniuses going after the inhibitor. Will Immortals go for the engage right here? Joey's leading the front line. He's going to come go. with his end of plate. Here comes the Solar Flare, and here comes the fight. Evil Genius is looking to survive it as they go right after Pretty, able to take him down. It's going to be Toadie Top who grabs that kill, and he wants to find more. Goes right after the inhibitor, takes it down, no problem whatsoever. Minions have met them at the bot side tower. Inhibitor going to be exposed. They're going to look to get the second one of the game and keep Immortals locked down into their base, and it doesn't look like there's much IMT can do about it. They're going to be able to back out and pick up the dragon as well if they so choose. Evil Geniuses with a big wing and stopping Immortals scaling up through these dragons. This is going to allow Evil Geniuses to put back Immortals five minutes towards having this potential win condition. These fights just not really coming through as Evil Geniuses are able to better execute on them rather routinely at this point. If they can continue to do this, it should be a pretty easy path for them to victory and back to that 1-1 one -one tie that they've become so known for. <laughs> uh, I completely forgot about that as we get deeper and deeper into this game. About 6.5k separating these teams. Evil Geniuses have a pretty strong hold of the game thus far. Throwing up that last Drake does deny that Dragon Soul point. And you got 4 minutes 30 seconds before Dragon Soul is going to spawn on the map once again. But well before that is going to be the Baron. 2 minutes 30 seconds before that hits the map. And Evil Geniuses are around that area. Mostly because they have nothing to do when it comes to the bot side of the map. Ooh, there's no inhibitors to play for. There's no camps to play for, there's no turrets, so you just gotta continue moving to the top side and continue to apply pressure where it makes sense. They're going to be uh, taking down this inhibitor here as we see, and Immortals, they're the ones you have to try and find something, but they're definitely better able to play these fights a little bit more defensively because of their mobility. It doesn't necessarily get you extra damage, but when you are be this far behind in terms of gold already, and your compositions are doing similar things, you get Busted. Oh, here we go. Joey going in, goes for the back line, tries to find contracts, Tony but contracts will return fire. Viper on the defense, 
has the broken blade fully healed and ready to swing away as he tries to take down evil geniuses. He will get mystiques. He will get kicked away. But look at the base. Tony Top going for the split push, looking to take down the base all by himself. Pretty will try his defense, but that tower is low and oh. it's getting lower. Now Viper wants to join in to shut down Tony Top. Tony Top's having none of that. He will flash away. Jojo will be able to join uh, with a teleport into the base. And now that Nexus Tower goes down. Evil Geniuses, they're fighting. They are going to take this game, or will they? Health bar so low, mortals cannot respond in time. Uh, Evil Geniuses, tie this up. Wow, every single time, Evil Geniuses decide that they are going to be going one and one on the day. And we see that it ends up being a situation that is just echoing so many of their other series. So they improve their series score just a little bit they are now three wins or four wins nine ties and two <laughs> losses like it's absolutely crazy how long these guys have been able to tie so many times and it's part of why they're at the top side of the standings because they're doing this to the lower seeded teams but they're also taking games off of the stronger teams across the board and we'll get to see a little bit more of how they actually got here right now yeah, take a look at some of the replays that went off with this game. It was pretty intense, because both of these teams, you could realistically see any of them winning it. These were bloodbath compositions that were meant to fight Joshi. They really were. Both of them had a lot of bruisers. We saw a lot of potential mobility coming through for Immortals, but it wasn't something that they were able to properly utilize. We saw Jojo Pion just kind of stat-checking people throughout a lot of this, while Viper did a fantastic job in the lane never really had any of these big blanks was never really able to have some of these big team fights that we know that he can sometimes do and even though they got really close to getting ocean soul almost isn't good enough in a game of league of legends you actually got to get all four three 75 percent that's still a c you guys man it really did look like they uh had it for quite a bit there but just the ruthless aggression that we saw coming out of Evil Genius is when they were able to start getting a lead. They didn't want to let it go. A lot of this off the back of both Tony Top and Contracts, as you can see in this fight right here. Uh, even in the fight prior where you saw Contracts trying his best, even though they lost that fight, it's still a good attempted play. Uh, Evil Genius is overall the top side of uh, their roster. It's just so powerful, man. It is. I also want to praise Evil Geniuses here for understanding that if they put Callista behind, it's very difficult for this champion to continue playing when they are 1-4 and four, like we see here. They're just behind the curve, and I also have to say that when there's a Frozen Heart on the enemy team getting picked up by Team Link with so many melee champions, it means that with all their attack speed slowed, you're actually doing a lot more than slowing their attack speed uh you're also making their champion feel worse to play because you expect your champion to have a certain attack speed and you're going to cancel more autos. So it's actually a greater result than you might expect based off of the item stats alone. So Evil Geniuses doing a good job itemizing, doing a good job playing the map in general and having a good understanding of their win. Man, that was a fun game number two as well. Just seeing the top lane and the Jax versus Riven matchup, you, you, you're kind of seeing the uh, pocket pick versus pocket pick. And both of Classics. them, they, they performed well. They performed really well. Viper had his standout moments. Tony Top had his standout moments. Uh, ultimately, it kind of makes sense why this game ended up in a tie at the end of the day. Uh, just a great series to go through. Unfortunately for both of these teams, it is a tie when they're desperately needing wins. Again, they have those powerhouse matches coming up very, very soon. For Evil Geniuses, I got to go take a look at that again. Cloud9 Team Liquid. Oh, um, excuse me, that's Immortals. Over for Evil Geniuses, that is 100 Thieves and FlyQuest, and pretty much every team I've just said that these teams are going against are top-of-the-pack teams. It's going to be really tough for either of these teams to necessarily move their way into the top three. I mean, yesterday we heard Golden Glue say it's like, oh, no, there's really just three teams that are in the contention for the top three, right? FlyQuest, 100 Thieves, and Team Liquid. And uh, these teams did rather well for themselves, and they are going to be going one and one so to cement their opportunities to play in the uh, post-game playoffs in the Proving Grounds and the Academy Summer Playoffs. But with that, we have Mystiques coming through to actually talk to us a little bit more about the game. Hello, Mystiques. Hi. How are you doing Hi. today? Hope, hope, you had a, hope you had a good, enjoyable time on the Rift today. <laughs> mm, the games were pretty boring, <laughs> to be honest. Like, the game one was oh. just a song, and game two was like... 
uh, we were losing and then we just won. I don't know. I think the second game was weird too. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I do want to ask a little bit about that matchup because, as you said, game one was a stomp, game two you're losing and then you just outright won. Uh, what were the comms like going uh, into game number two to uh, be able to have that turnaround victory? Mostly we just... Mostly we just uh, had to adapt in draft and we just like decided to ban Thresh instead of Kalista because that seemed a bigger problem for us versus uh, that. And then we were just fine. Like, I actually no, like actually they gave me like the, the perfect Alistair third pick spot. So that was, that was good. That was kind of lucky. And then we just picked Azure. I think we just like the, opted into a better, more comfortable draft for us for game two. So it, it was easier. Game one draft is still like fine for us. Game one draft is like fine for us. We played Diego and Lulu too before, but this Zach kind of threw us off, and we had like Lulu and Jinx into Zach. So I guess it's really hard for them to actually play if we don't punish the Zach early game, which we couldn't actually do because we didn't have prior buttons in it. Yeah, I mean, you're you're getting into it like League of Legends is a really complex game, but we're also kind of throwing a wrench at you guys here pretty soon. Contracts moving up to LCS and Tomio going to be joining you guys from Evil Geniuses Prodigies rather soon. Have you already started working with him? Like, is he gelling with the team? What? How is this going to be changing the way the Evil Geniuses Academy plays? Uh, uh, we have not played with him, with Tomio. We... We haven't scrimmed with contracts much too. We sometimes have weeks where we have like three different junglers on scrims. And we use some uh, solo queue player uh, because we have to. But we haven't scrimmed with Tomio. Looking forward, I think. Um, he's kind of similar in the way to contracts playstyle. So shouldn't be the big difference. But maybe we'll only be lacking some like um more decisive shot calling from contracts in the early game i don't know how tommy is but uh, we would i guess just see what happens but for me like i have no expectation like whatever will happen we will try to make it work and and we will see all right mistakes i do want to thank you for your time we do have other matches we got to get into and wish you the best of luck in your upcoming matches versus 100 thieves and FlyQuest. thank you very much have a good day guys all right, always nice, always soft-spoken. It's always a pleasure to be able to speak, uh, speak to Mystiques and get the inside of what's going on. But uh, interesting game to see go out. You know, this was very high stakes going 1-1 even. It's not the result either team really wanted when you're that desperate to climb the ladder. But again, there's one more week of play, one more week to improve those standings. I've just kind of struck a little bit, right? Like, you know, as a spectator, I thought that the games weren't the most exciting things we've seen in the world, but he was just like, I don't know, those games are kind of boring, <laughs> right? Like, when you're playing for this kind of stakes, it's kind of interesting to see how different the players perceive the game versus how the audience might perceive it, because it is just a very different experience when you're playing, like, a very standard game versus when a game gets kind of exciting. So, the Sneak's going to be going through. He has to be happy with the fact that they are still going to be in a slot for playoffs. I'm sure wishes they were able to get the 2-0. Well, that is game number one of the day, but we still got some more play. Coming up next will be the battle of David and Goliath as we have FlyQuest taking on CLG. We'll be right back with that matchup here on LCS Academy. Verizon believes everyone deserves the best. That's why we start with 5G from America's most reliable network. Verizon 5G is next level. Then give families plans to mix and match, so you only pay for what you need starting at $35. We have so much more than this a great network. And offer the best in entertainment on select unlimited plans, like Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and ESPN+, Plus, as well as Discovery+, Plus, with a Galaxy S21 Plus 5G when you buy one. There's no reason to settle for less than the best. Only from Verizon.